reflection this morning is based on the gospel reading from Luke chapter 4, which was read just a moment ago. The passage about the uh, woman at the well that Jesus encountered. Last week, that we've been going consecutively the last few weeks in John's gospel. Last week, when John chapter 3, uh, the episode that we read about was a conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious man. He was highly educated and uh, trained. He'd gone to the finest schools. He was a uh, religious scholar, a professional, a leader. He was a ruler, part of the Sanhedrin, which was uh, a ruling body. He had social standing, tremendous stature as a uh, community person. That was in John chapter 3. In John chapter 4, however, today's reading, we have someone at the very other end of the spectrum, uh, uh, socially, religiously, and morally. The encounter in chapter 3 is so different. It takes place at night. It's uh, Jesus talking to a man, uh, a Jew, a ruler. And in chapter 4, it's at midday. Uh, with a woman, a Samaritan, and a, an outcast, if you will. For those of you who are Beatles aficionados, if Nicodemus was Father Mackenzie, the woman at the well was Eleanor Rigby. Here we find the friend of sinners crossing the established boundaries of race, ethnic, uh, guides and of gender. But we should not be at all surprised, for the one that we are dealing with here today is the Savior of the whole world. And if you look back at the hymn we just sang, and pay attention and reread that later, and examine and meditate, if you will, on the words of that hymn, it is a mission about how the gospel is not just for one group of people or one select of people, but for all, the whole world. The kingdom of heaven won't just won't be segregated by race, by color, by socioeconomic status. The kingdom of God is diverse in that sense, and very much so. Well, okay, so this story is a little bit strange in a couple of ways. For the modern reader, we don't see this as readily. But in those days, and even now, in many parts of the Middle East, or in Orthodox Jewish communities, and even in some other ethnic groups, it is considered unseemly, improper, inappropriate for a man to be seen talking with a woman publicly, but that is not a close relative. It's his sister, or his wife, or his mother, that is not scandalous. But if a man is uh, speaking with a woman in, in, in that society, it was considered um, inappropriate. We're not used to that. That's foreign to us, but that's what that culture was like, and some places are still like that. Uh, pastor Raja Moni, who the Indian pastor who leads the congregation that worships here in this space every after Sunday afternoon has told me that he really is looking forward to the time when his wife, who is still back in India, uh, will be able to join him and come here so she can be a help to him in his ministry. Because sometimes in cultures, we're not always aware of the differences. So in those days, Jewish man would never have been seen talking with a woman in public in this manner. Now the second thing is, aside from that, she was a Samaritan. Now, if you do any kind of study on this passage, the commentaries will go into great depth about the geography of this story and why were they in this town and why did they go there and not go on this other route. And, and, it, and it goes on a great length explaining the history usually about the differences and why the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. But I won't, all of that's very interesting stuff. And any good study Bible 
We'll be able to give you some of that material that you can learn and get, go to sort of the advanced level of studying this passage, but I don't think it's necessarily conducive in a sermon. So suffice it to say that the Jews and the Samaritans had the same ancestry, but at some point in time, the Samaritan people had intermarried with other ethnic groups. And so they were seen as sort of ethnically uh, not pure, and their religion wasn't quite pure either. They were sort of uh, looked down upon by the typical Jewish person. So this woman, first of all, Jesus is talking to a woman. That was a little bit of a taboo. Secondly, he's talking as a Jew to a Samaritan. That, that's the second strike. That's the second reason that this episode was kind of shocking. Now, to put the cherry on the top of our Sunday, not only was he inter interacting with a, a, a woman in public, a Samaritan woman, but a woman who was known for being promiscuous. She was uh, rejected even by other Samaritans. I think that's very significant. Jesus, in John chapter 3, is talking to someone of high social standing, someone of, with, with power and influence. And in John chapter 4, he's talking to someone that has no influence, someone that is looked down upon, someone that if you are seen talking to them, you are guilty by association. Has anybody ever done that to you? Somehow uh, found uh, that you had a friend and that friend was, um, you know, maybe had some kind of blemish on their record or their reputation, and then they look at you differently because of that? You, we call that guilt by association. And we know that that's not an appropriate way to determine a person's character. You don't judge a person by necessarily by the people that they have uh, run across or, or, or have in their, in their back, background. But it would be a common reaction. It would be a very common reaction. So what, what's happening here in John chapter 4, the reason I spend so much time trying to set this up is because I'm trying to paint a portrait for you of what exactly is taking place. This isn't just another conversation where Jesus says some nice things that are hard to understand and then eventually talk about, well, okay, you know, God loves you. No, there's a real person here, and we don't know a lot about her. We don't know her name. She's completely anonymous. We, they, they go through this whole chapter. There's 42 verses about this woman, and we never find out her name. We don't know much. But yet we do learn some very personal information about her don't we? in a few moments. So here we have, uh, and it says it happened at midday. <clears throat> now, in some translations, it, I, I think the one that I just read, I don't actually recall, I think it said that at the sixth hour. Oftentimes it says that the sixth hour doesn't mean 6 a.m. because we, we tabulate the time by midnight. And uh, the sixth hour, if you read that in John's Gospel, uh, the first hour is sunrise. So the sixth hour would probably be about noon. We're talking midday. Now here's another one of those uh, points where having a little bit of cultural understanding adds a lot of meaning to the story. Why was this woman going to the well in the middle of the day? Here we are, we're close to the equator. It's the Middle East. It's very hot all the time. But especially when the sun is highest in the sky, that is not when you want to take your buckets, walk a mile and a half to the village well, fill them up so that they weigh about 25 pounds each, and then carry them all. You don't want to do that in the middle of the day. This, the common thing to do would be to do it at the beginning of the day, or maybe at the evening time, when it's cooler. And in, in those societies, that was actually a social thing. You know, that was the original water cooler conversation. The women would go out early in the morning to get the water that they would need to for the day for their cooking and cleaning and they would get their buckets and then they wouldn't just sort of very businesslike get their water and then go. They would stand around and they would exchange news about their families and maybe tell a little gossip here and there. It had a social function. 
This woman wasn't welcome amongst that group. It's the only explanation for why she would be there at this strange time of day. And she just happened to run into some strange man who starts talking to her. And she just happened to bump into Jesus, the incarnate Son of God. If you think that it happened in that manner, <clears throat> I uh, read an article this last week about my uh, uh, dear friend, we're not dear friends, but a uh, uh, scholar from Oxford, uh, famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it, Richard Dawkins. He's a, uh, a very militant atheistic uh, individual who goes around and debates about why there certainly is no God. And, uh, He's a scientist, and I don't know about his credentials. I'm sure he's very smart. But um, you know, Bertrand Russell in the early 20th century was a, was an atheist too. But when he when he wrote against religion, he did it very politely. <laughs> uh, Richard Dawkins, no such thing. When he writes about against religion, he's very very nasty. And and the thing is, he gets best selling books for being nasty towards religion. The world's changing. People used to write best-selling books that were friendly towards religion. Often now, that is not the case. So Richard Dawkins, I read the quote, it's an old quote, but I was reminded of it two days ago when I read it. Let's see if I can get it, get it straight. He said that if you believe in God, then you are either ignorant, stupid, <coughs> insane, or wicked. Ignorant, stupid, insane, or wicked. I think Richard Dawkins and, and people that believe in a world where there is no God believe that everything that happens just happens. Life just happened. We're here, but we just happen. It's all random and it's all chance. There's no direction, there's no meaning or purpose. When you die, you're extinct. It's over. Your identity has ceased. And I think that would be a very, from at least speaking from my perspective, I don't know if I'm, um, if I'm ignorant, stupid, insane, or wicked. I, I guess I would plead guilty for, of all four. But I also, I do know I'm very weak, and I would find it very, very hopeless to live if I thought there was nothing. More and bigger than myself. The world as we see it as Christians is not just, well, this happened and then that happened and then the next thing. That history has meaning. It's going somewhere. It's all coming together. It's taking a while, but it's all coming together for a purpose. And it has a goal. And we're on that path. And now this encounter makes sense. Jesus didn't just, uh, you know, by some random happenstance, end up at this well, at this time, to meet this woman. It's all part of God's divine work. And so there they are. And he starts out by um, asking her for a drink of water, and then they begin to uh, talk about that I think he might confuse her a little bit. He's talking about living water. First he asks her for water, then he says he's going to give her water, and she's thinking he doesn't have a bucket. How's he going to do this? But Jesus is starting to kind of go from the mundane or the earthly or the, the, the tangible to start to talk about something more important. He wants to cut to the chase and talk about heart issues, not just sort of uh, physical needs, but heart issues. And he uses the metaphor of water and thirst because he knows that this woman, like so many of us, is, is thirsty for something. Yours might be different. And I think the world is full of thirsty people, people that are craving some kind of fulfillment. Or I don't think, in my judgment of the culture now, I don't think people are searching for truth. 
I think they're searching for happiness. And whatever it is that they try to put into that emptiness, whether it is fame or sex or, or lots and lots of money, those things ultimately are unfulfilling. And you're never satisfied. You're never enough. And Jesus is trying to say, look, I can give you water which will make you so that once you drink of it, you will never thirst again. He's talking about a healing of the heart that takes place. He's talking about being filled up. As we heard from Romans chapter 5, God has poured out or deluged, flooded our hearts with his love. That's what Jesus is trying to move this conversation from, from one thing to another. In those days, it, you know, the metaphor of water and thirst, we get it, but it's not quite as poignant as it was. Uh, when, when you get thirsty, if my throat is dry, like it is right now, <laughs> I, can, I know where I can go. I, I, go, to, I go to my sink and uh, remove the cat, <laughs> and then uh, pour myself a glass of water, and I got refreshment. And I feel good for a little while. I don't. I, I, I'm satisfied. It's cool. My throat. Is, it feels so good on my throat. Or maybe you will do that, or you go to your refrigerator and get out a bottle of uh, fizzy Pellegrino. It's. And we're not really aware because of our modern conveniences of what it was like to live in a time when it was difficult to get water and people really did get thirsty and didn't have easy access to drinkable water. There are places like that still today. So be in an arid, hot climate like that. And Jesus is trying to say, I can meet that inner need that you don't even maybe know you have. So how does he kind of go from, uh, he's talking about living water, and then he wants to get, get real, get really real. <coughs> and he finally says something that uh, uh, people would think he would have said earlier. He said, go get your husband. Because, you know, it's strange, as I've been saying, for a man to talk to a woman in public like this. So he's saying, go get your husband. He knows what she's going to say. He knows each of us but as well as he knows himself. So he knows what she's going to say, that she doesn't have a husband currently. She's been through a string of five of them, and now that she's got a, she's cohabitating with a man with whom she is not married, and it's a bit of a scandal, and that's why she's there at noon instead of in the morning with the other women. She's kind of known for this being, this reputation. He knows this very well. And how does he bring this up, and why does he bring this up, this uncomfortable, awkward thing? Why would he want to talk about that? Let's, see, well, let's, let's just not get, get there. One of the duties or responsibilities of the Christian church is to spread the faith and to share the word of God with other people. And whenever you are, maybe you have had a friend or someone come to you to confide or they've needed some support so they come to you for prayer and, um, and uh, maybe you kind of know what to say, maybe it's caught you off guard. We should all kind of be prepared for that. Being a pastor, I get this a little more frequently probably than, than the average uh, bear, right? Because I wear the collar, I'm out on the street, I'm out in the, out in the town, out in the city. I, I get a fair amount of uh, people wanting to engage me negatively or positively, strangers. And I, uh, I t t tend to enjoy, enjoy it. It's not always easy, though. How do you start from talking about the weather, or isn't this a nice well, and wouldn't it be great to have a drink of water, to saying... Let's talk about your life. I was at a gathering not that long ago, a couple weeks ago, of a group of men. Not, not churchy men, necessarily. And there was uh, eating and drinking and talking, and, and um, some of the language that was being used wasn't a churchy language. And, uh, a few of the jokes that were told were things that uh, should not be told or be repeated. And so this is going on for a while, and it's a social thing. And, uh, you know, it comes to that inevitable point when finally one of the men said to me, So Scott, what do you do? <laughs> and then I dropped the P word <laughs> and 
and said, I'm a pastor of a church in Elmhurst. And I was going met the moment of silence. And there's always that moment. There's always that moment when you can see flashing across my face. What have I said? What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it's going to then result in them wanting to, oh, that's very interesting. Let's talk about it. Which often, happens, surprisingly enough, that happens frequently. But sometimes it's, you know, about face, march the other direction, say, do not pass go. This man said facetiously, how's business going? <laughs> and I said, very well. Uh, there's no shortage of sinful people. I wasn't talking about him, necessarily. I was talking about him. <laughs> but there's, you know, we, you call that, whenever you're having a conversation with somebody, and you're going to, and you know the conversation either is going to or should go to talking about Christ, you have to go through a moment that some have called the pain barrier. That moment where you're having a very relaxed exchange and then you're going to say something you know it's going to come when they're going to feel uncomfortable and that's going to make you feel uncomfortable and everybody's... So either you avoid it or you push through the pain barrier. They may wince a little, but that's what Jesus is doing right here when he says, hey, so, uh, you know, I know all about you, but go get your husband. He's trying to bring... Oh, isn't that the nicest thing anybody's ever said? <laughs>
irreligious woman in the midday sun. So how did Jesus push past the pain barrier? Well, the final point I want to make is I want you to look at how she responds when he brings out he, he brings out into the into the bright sun of day your sin. She then seems to change the subject. She says, um, well, you know, she asks a question about worship. She says, we Samaritans worship on Mount Gerizim, and you Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem. But why does she bring that up here? And I think the reason is, not that she's trying to divert the subject, change the conversation, because that was awkward and uncomfortable. I think what she's saying is, yes, I know I'm not right with the Lord. I need to get right with the Lord. What church do I go to? Do I go over here to get right with the Lord? Do I go over here to get right with the Lord? Tell me. And then what Jesus says is, in effect, he says, it's not that you need to go to the Lord. I'm the Lord, and I've come to you. The Christ, the Messiah, the one that you, as well as the Jews, have been looking forward to, the one that will tell you everything, the one that will make sense out of a senseless world, the one who's going to make things right. I am he. To this obscure nameless woman in Samaria, Jesus reveals point blank what he has chosen to conceal from others. I am the Messiah. Salvation comes from the Jews, but it's not just for the Jews. It's for everybody. Jesus Christ is the world's redeemer. Jesus is seeking out not only the devoted religionist in chapter 3, but the disenfranchised, godless woman of chapter 4. And what unites these two people, they couldn't be farther from one another, more different, but what unites them is their equal need for a Savior. In chapter 3, my friends, we learn that no one, in, well, no one is so good that they don't need Christ as their Savior. And in chapter 4, we learn that no one, no one is so bad that they have no hope for a Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God which passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Please rise and uh, turn, if you will, to the front of the hymnal to page 321. Each week in Lent we do a, a brief review of some part of the small catechism. Ten Commandments, page 321. What is the first commandment? You shall have no other God. What does this mean? You should fear God and trust in God above all things. What is the second commandment? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? Continue with the Nicene.